Building owners don't like it when they are paying $100,000 a year for their BNS maintenance contract, and then they are presented with a $50,000 fee proposal to do energy efficiency work. In their mind, energy efficiency and awesomeness should be built into the contract. Why should they pay $100,000 and then pay extra for high value tasks? It should be in there, built into there already. So today's video is the third and final part of the series. We're gonna wrap it up today. And we, we've we basically focused on trying to convince you that we do need to change how we do maintenance from periodic preventative maintenance into something a bit more modern and appropriate. And then to sort of facilitate that change in last week's video, we spoke about um, how can we change our 12 month plan to free up time that allows us to do high value tasks within our maintenance contract. In today's video, I want to touch on a few more things. Um, of course, we're not talking about, you know, how do you do the energy efficiency and what do you do when you're actually on site. These three videos have been about the first stage in facilitating this change to, to BMS maintenance. I wanted to talk a bit about what causes BMS equipment to fail. Because I think that if BMS equipment is properly installed, commissioned and tuned, it doesn't actually fail. Um, and it usually fails prematurely because it's not properly installed, etc., etc. So let's run through an example of a, a damper actuator for an air handling unit. Let's say an outside air damper. Now, what I find probably happens a lot of the time is that when the damper actuator is installed over the shaft and coupled on, if that's not done properly, the, the damper actuator is either not flush with the damper, so it's sort of slightly offset, and then as it's opening and closing, not sort of flush, that shaft starts to wear down. So when we're doing a commissioning in construction, it's working, it's opening and closing, it looks like it's working. Three or four years later, it's worn down in the shaft and then it starts to slip, and that's when an issue starts. Another example would be where, um, where the actuator comes onto the shaft, there's that U-bolt on the actuator, and there's two little screws you screw down on the U-bolt. If you don't screw them down evenly, so that it actually tightens down squarely on the shaft, if you tighten the one side down more, and it sort of pulls it around, the same thing happens. It works, it opens and closes, but after a few years, that not square on there, that slight angle, it starts to wear down the shaft, starts to slip again. So that's an example of where a poorly installed actuator, it fails. If it was properly installed, maybe we didn't have to check it every year or every second year or every third year. Another example would be this damper actuator, when the cable comes down into the actuator, if you take that cable down and you wire, if you put it into a loop and then into the actuator, you probably would have seen that sometimes. The reason why we do that, one of the reasons is, if water comes from somewhere, which is can happen quite a lot in a plant room or condensation and stuff, the water drips down the cable and then drips off the bottom. If, it, if the cable went just straight in like that, the water would run through, drip through, and it would actually get into the actuator through the stuffing gland. So that loop caused the water drop it to drop off. So simple things like that, um, they make a difference. You know, quite quite often the, the stuffing gland is not sort of tightened. So what I'm proposing here is that if the actuator was, the time was taken to properly install it, and then um, when we commissioned it and we tuned the PID loops, which the reason why I mentioned this is if, if the actuator is hunting slightly, so it's opening 10%, closing 10%, opening 10%, closing 10%, just a little bit, over a whole day, you'd hardly notice it, but that motor is driving, driving, driving. So instead of the, the motor driving, say, you know, 10,000 cycles before a failure, you know, it, it's gonna fail a lot sooner. So maybe now the motor will burn out in five or six, seven, eight years, instead of say 15 or 20 years. And it's, this stuff does happen because as we all know, BMS systems are not installed by BMS people that are really trained in how to install the equipment and have, have properly read the data sheet and read all the installation data sheets and, and practiced. They're usually installed by 
electricians. And it's often an apprentice electrician doing that sort of running cables and doing fit off. So a lot of the time, it's not the best person installing the equipment. And the reason why I'm mentioning this, or I'm sort of carrying on about it, is in your first year of maintenance, if you went through and properly, properly, properly check this equipment, so you loop the cable around and you tighten the stuffing gland and you got the actuator out with, um, with valves, with globe valves and linear actuators, if you actually made sure you took the actuator off, put it back on again, tightened the coupling, made sure it's all square on and all perfect, like that actuator is not gonna fail. Why is it gonna fail? It doesn't, it doesn't really have maintainable parts. You know, if you think about it, a BMS system, this is quite important actually, it's not like a car. So if you don't maintain your car, if you miss a couple of years, it'll be fine. But if you don't do maintenance, at some point your car will break. If you're not changing the oil and the brake fluid and changing brake pads and, and air filters, at some point your car will break. In my opinion, BMS systems are not like that. You can go to um, a valve actuator every year and drive it up and drive it down every single year. It's not going to last any longer. The process of doing BMS maintenance doesn't make equipment last longer. It, BMS maintenance, as you said in, in the very first video, is looking for broken things. You, you check the actuator, is it working? Drive it open, drive it closed. Yes, it's working, move on. But that process of doing maintenance does not make the instrumentation last longer. So the thought there is, if we went through and properly installed everything 100%, um, I wouldn't bother checking that for five years. Um, so like every year through your optimization and your tuning functions, you will be checking the temperatures and pressures. We really spoke about that, like the graphics and the trends and the alarms. So if that thing did fail, you'd find out about it. It probably won't. So why waste valuable um, man hours checking equipment that won't break if it was just installed properly? Now, the other thing I want to talk about was Considering what it costs to maintain something over 10 years, and what is it, and what is the risk of it failing, and what is the impact? And a good example here is um, an air handling unit's fan run status or the pressure switch. Okay, a pressure switch, it has some moving parts, right? There's a diaphragm in there, but it doesn't have gears and things like that. So a pressure switch is unlikely to break for no reason. So, and if it does break, what happens is that morning, the BMS says, start the fan. It doesn't start in 60 seconds. We get a fault. We get an alarm that says, mismatch alarm, go check that out. So the day the pressure switch packs up, we're told about it, we go fix it. It's not like it's gonna be broken for three months before you notice it. We'll know straight away. So you could then go up to the equipment, you could override the fan on, or you could just you know bridge out the terminals for a bit. Now, if you have 20 of these not very expensive, in a, in a cupboard somewhere, you run across there, you grab one, you come back, you pull the two tubes off, you take those two screws out, you take the two wires out, it's a really quick change. So why should we go and check that pressure switch every single year? Um, or as I proposed in the previous video, every second or third year, like why even, even do it then? Because it's unlikely to break. If it does break, it's not a huge impact and you can change it very quickly. It's very cheapest to hold spares. So the, the, the thought there is we've restructured our maintenance into a three-year plan or whatever it is. We freed up blocks of time. The second layer is let's consider what needs to be checked and when. So get your service check sheets, which is like a points list. You know, have HU1, all the points, and then go and check it once properly, tick it off, put the date in there, and then like skip three or four years. Come back in three or four years. Like every year you could say, like I checked it through optimization or I, I checked it through tuning. You can still keep an eye on it and, and, your, and your progress and how you do this, but don't go and check it. You know, things like in a situation where the BMS is automatically checking something, like we said there with the mismatch with the fan come on, the fan status, I just never check it ever again. Never, never ever check it again because when it does fail, just deal with it then. It's not worth wasting precious man hours on something like that, the risk is low. A couple of years ago, a BMS um, salesman or a BDM business development manager, he came to me and said, look, Brass, we're not winning work. How can we differentiate ourselves from our competitors and win more work, new, new construction work? And I said to him, 
go and sort your service department out first. If you have, if you provide the best service and you, your department is awesome and clients are getting high value within maintenance, um, there will be a knock on effect of you winning work because people want you maintain their BMS. But if you do like poor BMS maintenance or don't provide much value, there's no differentiator there. You wanna win more work, do the best maintenance you can. Another thing is, if you went to a client and said, hey, listen here, we are gonna restructure our maintenance. We're gonna do this, this, and this. And this is gonna generate savings and energy efficiencies. Your, your building's energy efficiency rating will start to improve just organically through maintenance. And you did that, and after 12 months of doing that, and it cost you nothing, you know, just re moving man hours around. After 12 months, and they're, they're seeing an improvement, and everyone's doing high fives and really excited about it. Um, if you then went to a client and said, listen here, we've got made really good savings this year, but the next layer of our energy efficiency program is that we wanna do a chiller management system upgrade. So we need to go buy some magnetic flow meters. We wanna upgrade the variable speed drives, whatever it is, it's gonna cost you you know, $100,000. The client is more likely to sign off on that because they trust you and you've shown them your value without just putting your hand out for, for money from the start. So, you know, cause sometimes when I run through this on projects, when I'm issuing the maintenance specification and I sort of catch up with the BMS guys for a coffee, listen guys, I'm not gonna screw you on this. We're gonna work together. I'll compromise, let's get a good outcome. The issue for these guys is that the BMS account managers, they normally have KPIs to generate additional revenue on the service contracts. It's not a bad thing, that's life, that's what we all do. But I always say to them, you know what, you're, you're totally right, you're gonna lose some of that money. But there'll be other projects that will get signed off more easily as I just explained. But the, the other part is that when that BMS is, is up for renewal and it's, and it's obsolete, your client is gonna to wanna to keep you there because they love you. Whereas now what happens usually is the BMS company does not provide really good value to their clients. And by the time that 10, 10 year cycle or 15 year cycle is up, they come to people like me and say, hey, we wanna do a BMS specification, we wanna to go to market, we wanna change our BMS system out for a new one. It's, it's, you know, it's not that often where the incumbent just retains the site after 15 years because you had, for 15 years, you didn't build up this relationship and this trust that they would say, like they may say, Bryce, let's go out to market because we have our procurement process forces us to do that. We might do a specification, a tender phase, go out to market and come back. As long as your price is in the ballpark, you'll probably, you'll probably get the job. It's much easier to stay with the incumbent. It's much easier easier, not as complicated. But by that time comes, you don't, you haven't normally built up that um, that relationship or that sort of advantage. So that's it. That's the, the three-part series on BMS maintenance. I'm pretty sure all of you have a couple of ideas to go out there and just do something to show your value and build up your trust with your client. Um, in, the, in the description below, I'll have a little link to a website page on my consulting website, not the training website. Um, if you're a building owner or a facility manager and you wanna go through a, a structured process to do this, it's like a 25 page specification. What we spoke about here in the last three videos is just how do you facilitate the freeing up of free time. But obviously the specification would run through all the other stuff, all the reporting, all the KPIs and all that sort of stuff that's built into it that would be reviewed annually at the end of the year. and. To be honest, I've run this through Honeywell, Seaman, Schneider, Johnson Controls, and Allerton, and not a single company had any issue with it. They were like, yep, we'll do that. We agree with it. And for a lot of companies, they like the idea because at the end of the year, they knew exactly how they were gonna be measured. So they could work towards that. At the end of the year, everyone's happy, there's no surprises. What happens now is often owners will come to me and say, Brass, we are very unhappy with our maintenance. Uh, we want somebody else in here. And every single time I've said to them, hold on a sec, let's just work out where the breakdown is. And every time we have managed to sort the problem out without going to upgrade. And it always happens, you sit down with the BMS company and they're like, what do you mean? Like, we're doing what our fee proposal says. Like, according to us, we're doing a good job. We're doing preventative maintenance, blah, blah, blah. BMS companies are often doing exactly what they feel they should be doing, but yet the owner wants something else and there's a disconnect between that. So the maintenance specification just aligns the two. We all sign, we all agreed, let's go for it. Right, please like and subscribe. See you guys later.